This is Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dear to Dream. It's a pleasure to be here. Right now, the show is trending in Austria, which makes me happy. Think where my people are originally from. We say Dashinger, but it's really Dachinger. So I'm really glad every time I see a different country pop and we're in the top podcast there because it just means to me that y'all are getting the message and that you are on this journey as well with an open heart and a contribution to the world and humanity. And that is important. This podcast has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award. And we were just listed. What a wonderful surprise. Thank you, Welp Magazine, as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. I thank them for the beautiful energy work they do out in the world. If you would like to become a facilitator or attend one of their classes anywhere globally, go to drdaneher.com as well as accessconsciousness.com. Again, I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm your host of the show. I've been doing this for 14 years, and I am a visibility and media expert. And what I do out in the world with visibility is around books and interviews. Everything I do, I also coach. So I show coaches and entrepreneurs and speakers and healers the very time-effective steps to write a highly engaging book. I take you from idea of book to finish book. And FYI, we have two spots that just opened. If you want to be part of the book writing class and be led by an expert, go to debbiedashinger.com slash visible visionaries, because two of our authors were successful and just published. They're all moving along to the finish line. So you can grab those spots, debbiedashinger.com slash visible visionaries. I also take authors' books fully done for them to a guaranteed international bestseller status. And that's what you can do to work with me. And the show today is going to be with a transcendental meditation leader, a medical doctor, neuroscientist, and an international scholar with mastery in both modern science and timeless ancient Vedic wisdom. My guest today is Dr. Tony Nader, a medical doctor trained at Harvard University and MIT, PhD in neuroscience, and a globally recognized Vedic scholar. As a scientist and scholar with mastery in both modern science and ancient Vedic tradition, he was chosen by the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi to be his successor and is the head of the nonprofit International Transcendental Meditation Organizations in over 100 countries. Dr. Nader guides the TM programs and their practical applications in education, health, business, defense, agriculture, and other fields. You can learn more about him and his work at tonynader.org. It's T-O-N-Y-N-A-D-E-R.org. And with that, I welcome Tony to the Dare to Dream show. It's great to have you. Wonderful to be with you, Debbie, and congratulations on all the wonderful work and the success you are having. Thank you so much. I have to say the universe knew you were coming on this show. So we, I've had all these synchronicities. And just this week, it's not that I'm unaware of your organization. I am fully but so many synchronicities on television. I'd see something and it referenced the Maharishi and I'd go online and I'd see something. And just this morning, I turned on YouTube on the television because I was gonna do a stretching class. And at the last minute, I saw a meme of Jim Carrey and it said the best motivational speech ever. And it suggested, you know, if I watched it, how inspired I'd feel. Now I've actually heard this speech several times in audio and otherwise, but I hadn't seen this meme, this version. And I turned it on and as the universe was having a good time, it said very clearly that this amazing speech he gave was what at MUM, the Maharishi University for Management 2014 graduates. So I sat there watching and said, wow, I'm really supposed to meet Tony today. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yes, nature is talking and we hear, we listen. Those who have ears that are open, they can hear the the symbols and the messages, uh, you know, without being superstitious, but 
uh, there are things that happen that connect us all. And uh, when your attention is on a certain level, it can bring out certain levels of uh, experience and connectedness that that happens. So I believe in that. It's wonderful. Mm, yeah, I like that they were cheering us on. And I just want to give a quote because it was so powerful when he said this. And this is not a Maharishi co co quote, excuse me, Jim Carrey quote. But he said, so many of us choose our path based on fear, which is disguised as practicality. So very powerful. You, Dr. Nader, were not afraid <laughs> because <laughs> looking over your resume, it's incredible what one human being can do and contribute. So you're a medical doctor, but I'm curious, what kind of journey did you agree to or undertake that led you to be appointed unexpectedly to represent TN and also the Vedic tradition? Uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who is the founder of Transcendental Meditation, based on the ancient knowledge from thousands of years uh, ago, uh, old, passed on in a, in a tradition of teacher to student, uh, has wanted in this scientific age that the knowledge that he is bringing be uh, understood and evaluated in a scientific way. And so he uh, looked into science and has encouraged the technologies that he is bringing to be scientifically examined and uh, to compare also the ancient wisdom, ancient structures of knowledge with what we know today about physics and chemistry and biology and physiology and human behavior. And so having myself uh, a very... Uh, long, uh, let's say, background in medicine and science and research, uh, and then working with him for many years on the ancient knowledge that he is bringing and comparing those and finding connectedness. Uh, he felt probably <laughs> that uh, it would be good in this time to have a scientist uh, who also knows Vedic knowledge and ancient knowledge represent the, the, the programs that he is offering so that it's seen more on also an objective level, although it's a subjective knowledge of introspection going back to the self, on the mental and consciousness development, yet it has so many impacts on the individual and society that it can be analyzed objectively with scientific uh, research and scientific studies. What was it like for you to know him, to spend time with him? What kind of person was he and how did he impact you? He was very, very simple. And he even uh, often used the term simple. Is this simple? He would ask, which means it's not complicated. That life is really at its basis, very simple. And that we make things complicated by not being ourself, um, simple about things and innocent and present in the way we are, say the things we feel in an innocent way, of course, but also be uh, sensitive to others, uh, elevate them, give them inspiration, look at the right things. And so he was all of this, whatever he thought he really was, and he was really present. He had that very deep presence, which is one of the things that uh, inspired me from the very first moment I met him. And that is that sense of connectedness. I felt when I was with him that uh, as if the whole universe stopped and as if for him, nothing else existed except me. And that ability to naturally give attention to whatever one is doing fully, wholeheartedly, and simply means that the mind is not cluttered with other fears, as you mentioned, and divisions and expectations or <clears throat> manipulation or trying to, to please or not to please, but just the ability to be oneself and to be present. And this was one of the great, uh, great aspects of him. Of course, he had many other wonderful 
uh, aspects that I really enjoyed. For example, his ability to see beyond the problems, uh, to find what we can say, the third element, which means if you have two choices and you think these are the only two choices that you have, and oftentimes he would come with an unexpected solution, an unexpected choice. Uh, that is, you know, the ability to see that sometimes you don't have to leave something to take something else. Sometimes there is a way to, to have everything together in harmony and find a way that even opposites can coexist and uh, create a dynamic of progress rather than clash. And so this was really uh, some of the wonderful uh, visions that he has. And he was also full of humor and, and sense of joy and happiness. You know, some, some used to call him the giggling guru because he was, he was really, uh, he was enjoying inner bliss and it was radiating and you can feel it in his presence. Mm. And is your family now all involved with transcendental meditation? Do you all practice? Is this a part of your life? Yes, my parents, my sister, my family, my wife, my children who are young, they all meditate. And very my most close to me friends, they also practice it. Uh, you know, I felt it was so profound in its effects and benefits that I certainly wanted those who are close to me to share, to, to try it. And uh, it was uh, really possible and they adopted it in a simple way. Mm. You've got a new book out. It's called One Unbounded Ocean of Consciousness. And in it, the Maharishi describes the source of all physical and materials as a field of consciousness. So what is this consciousness that exists in a field? Consciousness is a, a big question, even today in science. Where does it come from? You know, what is consciousness? Is uh, the ability to be aware, the ability to be conscious. But ability to be conscious is the ability to reflect on oneself and experience uh, the different aspects of our life in a way that we realize what they are and we experience them uh, as a witness in a way. So when we have pain, we feel the pain and we experience the pain. And it's something that is beyond the material level of experience of, uh, of existence, let's say. So experiencing, being aware of is consciousness. Now, there are in modern science and in ancient Vedic knowledge and in ancient knowledge and philosophy also, lots of conjecture about what is consciousness, where does it come from? In modern science, uh, there is an attempt to understand how the nervous system works and how in its complex functioning, it allows consciousness to emerge. And this is why they call it an emergent quality. And uh, many scientists assume that uh, consciousness is present only in humans. And for the longest time, it was thought to be a human characteristic. But now we realize animals have consciousness. We even know that the environment, that even trees and, and plants, they react to things. They have uh, uh, experience as if to which they react. And that is uh, something that is indicating that there is some level of consciousness, not only in the animate life, but also in the possibility of inanimate life. The problem is that we try to assign consciousness to animals or trees in the same way as we judge our own consciousness or we experience our own consciousness. And then it's not possible to find the same consciousness as human have in different aspects of life and nature. This is because the other aspects are not developed enough to have that kind of consciousness. So 
the very first thing we have to realize is the concept that anything that senses anything else, that responds to anything else, we can call that consciousness. So we are expanding the definition of consciousness from human consciousness, where we have consciousness of the self, consciousness of the present, past and future, memories, experiences of higher values, spiritual experiences, and we can have thought, and we can have imagination. Uh, this is on the human level. Now, on the other species and the other creatures in, in life and in the world, it is not the same. It's not that if we say the tree has consciousness, that the tree has necessarily the sense of self, for example. It doesn't have a sense of self, uh, most likely. Uh, it doesn't feel scared and doesn't have an idea of the future, doesn't have an idea of uh, memories of the past. Maybe it has internal memories of events that is also possible within its system but it doesn't have the same consciousness as an animal have, or even in the animal kingdom, there are different layers we know of, for example, certain animals, they recognize themselves in the mirror, and there are studies to see that they have some kind of self-awareness, whereas lower kind of species animals, they do not recognize themselves. They think it's, if you show even a cat or a dog in the mirror, they think it's another cat or another dog. And so they don't have that level of awareness that we have as humans, but there is a, a hierarchy, if you like, of different levels of consciousness. If we were to expand consciousness to say that it is anything that is experienced, any kind of experience. So even if um, uh, it's an experience of gravity, for example, like a stone falls on the ground and it, it experiences gravity in a sense. Uh, it just senses gravity and falls to the ground. Of course, we can say, oh, what do you mean? This is a physical automatic uh, law of nature and there is no sensing uh, on an intellectual level. Of course, there is no sensing on an intellectual level. So when the stone falls, it doesn't say, oh, I'm going to fall, I'm going to break myself, what is gonna happen to me? I'm going to feel pain. The stone doesn't feel pain, doesn't have sense of self, doesn't have anything, but just the mere sensing, the mere experiencing, we can say is an elementary, uh, primordial, very elementary level of uh, consciousness. So what this brings us to is the fact that consciousness is not just one thing. There are different levels of being conscious from a most elementary level to a much higher level in the human beings. And within human beings, there are different stages, different levels, different developments of higher and higher states of consciousness which in the spiritual realm also include higher enlightenment and liberation and all of that. And we know that we are not conscious in the same way all the time. You know, Sometimes we are uh, tired and we are stressed and our consciousness can be dull. So we don't see things as clearly. And sometimes we are rested, we are clear. If we have meditated properly, we transcended, we went into ourselves. We can have a true experience of the self. So there is all this range of consciousness. Now, I haven't answered fully your question, but it was necessary maybe to have an idea of what, what do we mean by consciousness? Ultimately, scientists therefore are looking for consciousness. And is it an emergent quality or is it a primordial quality in, in life and in nature? And there are these different theories. My understanding from the tradition and my uh, conclusions, which I present in the book, One Unbounded Ocean of Consciousness, is that actually consciousness is primary, which means it is not the material interactions of the physical energy and matter that create a complex nervous system, that ultimately creates consciousness, but it's the other way around. 
all that we see in life, all that we experience is an expression of consciousness. So how is that? It's quite a complex stepwise logic that one has to go through. But in essence, the, this is the answer to the question, how is consciousness is a field? And that means there is a primary consciousness which manifests in infinite number of ways through the different levels of creation and experience and in different ways in our physiology, the heart, the mind, the, the physical, the mental, the, the nervous system, they are all expressions of consciousness. Mm. So it's in this way that it is a field. Will you take us through your experience, Dr. Nader? You've probably clocked in thousands upon thousands of hours of meditation, and you do it twice a day. You've got a mantra, 20 minutes twice a day. So take us through that. But I would like the component of what is that experience? And I know, because I've practiced it as well, it can be rather nameless. It can be very difficult to put in words, but if you can give some sense of that for you, so maybe viscerally we can follow. Let's seek the let's think of the mind as an ocean, mm. uh, and the ocean has waves on its surface. So we think of the mind not just as the wave that appear on the surface, but there is the inner depths of the ocean. So in transcendental meditation we go from the surface level of the ocean towards the inner and inner depths of the ocean. Now, the ocean is active on its surface and quieter and quieter as we go deeper towards the bottom of the ocean. We go deeper and deeper and deeper. The ocean, the normal ocean, becomes more settled. It's in the same way that our mind, which is jumping on the surface, as it dives deep within itself, it goes to deeper and deeper levels of quietness and quietness and quietness until it reaches the bottom of the ocean, which is absolutely quiet, completely silent. So the mind can be on all these levels and we can experience a thought also on all these levels. Imagine a thought as a bubble coming from the bottom of the ocean, a tiny little bubble. It's so small, you cannot barely see it. And then as it goes up in the, in the ocean, it becomes bigger and bigger. And then it reaches the surface. And there you realize, I have a thought. So we have thoughts, but we don't know where they're coming from. During transcendental meditation, we close the eyes, and through the technique, we allow the mind to dive deep within itself. And as it dives deep, it experiences this more settled state, more settled state, going from one level of surface thinking to the source of thought, the source of creativity, the source of all that is the basis of our activity and our achievements and our fulfillment. So as we dive deep, we say we are transcending, which means we are going beyond. That's what the term transcend means. So we are going beyond the surface to a deeper, a deeper to a deepest level, and then ultimately to the deepest level, where there we have what we call pure consciousness. Pure consciousness is a state of being aware, fully awake, not sleeping, of course, fully awake because it's consciousness, but it has no element in it. It has no thought, no mantra, no thought, nothing. Pure being, pure existence. It's like you have a movie on the screen and there is a big screen and as if the pictures fade and fade and fade and fade, and then you come with the screen. So that pure consciousness is like the screen on which all the movies of life are happening, but we forget the screen and we are taken by the movie. 
So in transcending, we go actually to the source that upholds actually all the pictures and the, the movies. And in fact, that screen is not like a white screen in the movie where it, the projector projects something on it. It's actually a screen that itself produces the movie. <laughs> it is the screen that has, it's like an LED or OLED screen. And that is, you know, a screen that itself creates the movie, but you can experience also the screen itself. So what you do in transcendental meditation is transcend, which means dive towards your pure consciousness. And what is beautiful is that this pure consciousness is your true self. This is your ultimate supreme self, your pure being, you know, Satori or Nirvana or Samadhi, for those who, you know, are interested in these different from different Eastern cultures. But in the, in the modern tradition, we just call it pure consciousness or the big self. So our true self is that infinite field of consciousness which is, as we said before, the source of all that there is, which means the whole creation, the whole manifestation, the whole expressions of life come from that. And that is our true self, an infinite pure being that is not limited by thought or speech or anything. It's totally transcendental, that is true spirituality. That is absolute, infinite, pure spirituality. And that is the experience of what infinite silence. In fact, it is nothing physical, but it's everything on the level of being. It is the source of all that there is. So it is fullness from its own true nature yet it is nothing material and nothing physical on the outside or, or specific in a sense. It is a non-specific pure being. Do you still have times when you are about to meditate where it takes you a while to drop in, where your head is going, thoughts, maybe a situation? Um, yeah, one can have this, you know, when you live through life, you get exposed to uh, situations and circumstances. And even if this being is already well established within you, there will be some, uh, some memory of something that can come. Uh, but the technique is so easy, so simple that you just close the eyes and you're back into that. You know, and this leads us to, to what we call different states of consciousness. This, the states of consciousness where you transcend, we call it a fourth major state of consciousness. Major states of consciousness, uh, normal states of consciousness, they include sleep, dream, and waking. Mm -hmm. So these are the usual cycles we go through, deep sleep, dreaming, and waking. And each has its own physiological characteristics as well as mental experience. Transcending is an, a fourth major state of consciousness. Why? Because it's the only state of consciousness where you experience total silence, total quietness. The body is also settled because when the mind settles, the body also settles very deeply. Mm -hmm. And this has been analyzed scientifically. There is greater coherence in the functioning of the nervous system. We see that there is coherence between the front of the brain, the back, uh, the, back the right and the left. Very high coherence, great alertness, wakefulness, with at the same time, completely quiet, settled experience. And the physiology is very, very rested. So this is what we call restful alertness. And you don't have this in sleep because in sleep you are rested, but you are not awake. In dream, you have activity of mental activity that is illusionary and the body can go through physiological changes. At the same time, you are not truly awake. You are you know, hard to wake up. In fact, it's harder to wake up somebody who is dreaming than somebody who is in deep sleep. Mm. And then you have waking state in which you're active and you're awake. So in none of these others, you have this combination of deep rest at the same time, great alertness. 
And that is transcendental consciousness. That is experiencing pure consciousness. And this you experience during these few minutes of meditation, morning and evening. But as your practice continues, you will more and more uh, have that inner silence with you, even though you are uh, active on the outside. So therefore, this restful alertness stays with you. And therefore, when you're active, you're no more shaken by outside situations and circumstances. You are well established in yourself and you are not subject to change and uh, other things. Of course, you experience things fully. You are clear, you're alert, you see things even clearly because you don't have the stress and the um, you know, clouding of fear, fear and feelings and stresses and you know, anxiety and all of that. Because you're well established in the, in the self, you have anchored your boat in the ocean, very well anchored. And no matter how big are the waves, you are very settled within and you are very dynamic in the outside. So we can say that meditation is for action. Transcendental meditation is for action. It's not just to be rested and have a few minutes of feeling good, but it is to be able to come out and be effective in one's activity in the outside. Oh, so powerful. Some of the things you said was going to the source of thought, the thought of all, the source of all, infinite pure being, pure existence. I can't imagine anybody not rushing to do that and be that. I want to ask in light of all of that, because the subtitle of your book is simple answers to the big questions in life and considering that we are living in very interesting times and people's emotions have been quite high um living in uh, global climate warming and a lot of interesting things in countries there's also and i always like to say this i think it's so important interesting times but there's also beautiful times there's so much that always concurrently goes on that is amazing that I like to pay attention to because that's the world I prefer to live in. For people who may be feeling a crisis or some real world situations and the difference that TM can actually do for them, how can we address that? Any kind of stress or fear, feeling, fearing what's going on globally, uh, what, what are the implications with TM? With TM, we have... Uh going back to that which is, as you expressed, uh, the self, which is a stable state of being to pure consciousness. We transcend, so we go beyond the difficulties and we anchor our boat, our ship, in our own self. What is happening is our ship is being tossed around by the waves, by situations and circumstances, and we become like a football in the hands of situations that throw us around. And when we are like this, we don't have our full potential that is being used because we are living in a state of a fight or flight response all the time. And that is a natural reaction of the body and the mind in difficult situations that the body has to be prepared to fight. And this we have inherited from the jungle that you know we have to be ready to fight or to run away. And it's not the time to think about higher values or music or beautiful things. And therefore what happens is that the entire nervous system and we see this even physiologically uh, per performs in a way that favors the parts of the nervous system that deal with the fight or flight response. And these are in the limbic system, the amygdala, there are specific parts of the nervous system. And we see that those who undergo stress and like this, these parts actually develop more. But what happens is less of the blood flow and less of the nourishment goes to the upper part of the nervous system which is the cortex, which is the executive part of the brain, particularly the frontal area, which is like the CEO of our uh, physiology and our activity and our thinking. And so those parts are not favored during 
the stress. When the stress is chronic and there is fear, then we don't have the ability actually to think uh, beyond the box, beyond the limited values, to think in a way that is more creative. What transcendental meditation does is give the individual the ability to let go during these few minutes. It doesn't mean we are running away from situations. Situations have to be dealt with. We have to be practical on the outside. But we need to give rest to the body and to the mind so that we have enough strength, enough creativity, enough energy, enough intelligence to deal with the situations. So situations are of many, many kinds, of course. But in general, nowadays, it's situations of stress, anxiety, sometimes depression, fear for the future. There is uncertainty what will happen, what will be you know, the future of things. And so in these situations, what we need is to take a step back and go back to ourselves. And that will help us to be able to handle this, the, the, whatever we're going through and have the most creative, most capable ability to, to overcome whatever we are doing. And this is really possible. It's possible on a practical, simple level. It's also possible on the level of being, because as we go back to the source of creativity and intelligence, we are able to act from a platform that uh, gives us mastery over our life rather than being football of situation and circumstances. So, Transcendental meditation has shown that the blood flow, for example, during the practice goes up to the upper levels and layers because one is no more in this situation of fear and anxiety. And therefore, one comes out with a feeling of greater creativity. The artists, you know, the, have shown that their, you know, color schemes increase and their ability to paint or to to create, uh, you know, movies and scientists discover things and managers have uh, greater ideas and students have better grades. And all of this has been studied scientifically. So we have more than 600 scientific research studies, peer reviewed, um, published in, in great scientific journals that show the effectiveness of all of this on all fields of life, including health, you know, there is decrease in heart attack and stroke, there is, uh, uh, you know, less damage, less admission to hospitals, better immune system, greater rejuvenation of the body. And that's really very simple, you know, when you rest well in the night, you wake up, you feel fresh, you can deal with situations better. If you have not rested in the night well, then you wake up, you feel not so great and the situations feel that they overcome you that they are stronger than you just this simple experience tells us that if we have even much much deeper rest than the sleep and a better quality of rest during these few minutes then we are able to use that reservoir of intelligence that is within us and creativity that is within us and naturally overcome uh, anxiety and problems. So this is on the individual level, but there is another whole level, which is of course very important. And that is the collective consciousness that we can also talk about if you like. Yeah, I would love to talk about that perfect segue because that was, that's where my mind was going is, and I don't know if this is the same of, as what you're referring to, but I was wondering about shared consciousness and group meditation. And I know enough from other people's scientific research work, it's profound what can happen in that field. Will you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, this joins back the paradigm of consciousness is all there is and its basis of all that there is, but also it joins the uh, finest, and most modern scientific findings about the nature of reality. 
you know, we see things are different, 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 and different from each other, and they are not connected to each other. You know, I, I'm sitting somewhere in Europe, you're sitting somewhere else in the US and others, and we're so different. And so on the surface level, maybe, uh, uh, you know, so different in space and time and all of that. But when you look deeper of what is everything made of, uh, you really come to this field, which is unified field, the same field that we call consciousness. And uh, how is this so? You know, we are all made out of cells. Cells are made out of molecules. Molecules are made out of atoms. Atoms are made out of elementary particles. And as the physicists kept diving deep into the smaller, they found that even the elementary particles are only excitations of fields, which are electromagnetic fields, strong force, weak force, gravity. We, we don't need to go into the fine physics details, but these fields have been more and more unified. And so like we used to think there is electricity on one side and magnetism on the other side. Nobel Prize was given to those who unified this as said it's electromagnetic field. And then further unification of even deeper level and deeper level. And now we have an understanding that all that there is comes from one unified field. It's physics. It's not, uh, you know, only theory and, and uh, knowledge and esotericism, but it's actual physics that says that there is one unified field. I mean, the, the theories about it are still discussed and, and which mathematical formulas are right, which not, but there is that outlook of a, of a unified field, one field that actually connects everything, which means we are not independent entities. We have very deep entanglement, they call it even, connectedness with the entire universe. So there is, uh, it's like a field of potentialities, of probabilities, but in which we, in our individual actions and thinking and behaving, create an effect that is beyond the limited value of our physical existence as far as our body is concerned in terms of, we're not limited in our skin. We are much more than that connected in a very, very deep way. So even physics lends credibility and support of the wave reality of particles. And as we are made all of particles, we are also in that interconnectedness. Now, the only step we want to make is that to call this unified field a field of consciousness, which it is. And therefore, as human beings, we can access that field. We can access that field, which is the source of the entire universe, source of creation, source of being. And where is it? We shouldn't look anywhere far. It's within us. It's deep within ourselves. And that's what happens when we transcend. We go to that field. Now, that creates a wonderful effect for ourselves that the science has shown. But more than that, since we are interconnected, if a number of people practice this technology of consciousness together, this transcendental meditation, and it has advanced techniques, we have seen repeatedly that there is a change in society. There is decrease in crime. There is decrease in conflict in society, there is improvement even in things like accidents of the road, uh, you know, and other problems that have been studied uh, with large groups of practicing. And we have done this research uh, prospectively, which means it's not like, oh, we did it and then we went back and researched. We did that also, but we said, okay, now we want to do it forward, which means we told the scientists, look, we're going to create the effect. Can you believe that? They say, no, it will never happen, <laughs> most, most, mostly. But we actually did it. And we had the scientists sit and examine 
And we did one big one in Washington, DC, and we predicted that there will be a reduction in crime in the city uh, at a time where it was totally unexpected. Because if you look at the statistics for the previous years, you can see that it's not a time or a period where suddenly you get reduction in crime. And so we come and benefited from that and tried to assume that this is our doing. We did it at a time when crime was high and the likelihood of crime re reduction was very, very low. And we have had such amazing uh, findings and results that it was published in peer reviewed, respected social journals even though the scientists said, we cannot understand how it happens, but the science is so good and so accurate that we cannot refuse this publication. We have to keep an open mind. So this effect is very powerful, very important uh, to drive the behavior of also society, not just individuals, but also society society as a whole has a collective consciousness. You call it shared consciousness. Yes, shared consciousness. When individuals are stressed, society is stressed. When individuals are in fear, society is in fear. The same way as we have neurons in our brain that work in a certain way, they seem to be together creating the reality of what we experience. We as individuals in society, create a collective awareness that motivates and directs the behavior of society, of the people in society. So the leaders in society, the managers, the leaders of companies, et cetera, they are also motivated by the collective awareness mm. that is in a nation, that is in a company. And if those collective awareness is higher, is improved, is clearer, then the decisions are better and the ability to find solutions to problems is much easier because this is really the light of knowledge and the light of experience. If you are in a dark room, people walk around, they hit themselves against the table, against each other, they fight, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to find their path. If in a lit room, then you know your path. And consciousness is really like the light. It brings the light of knowledge, of experience, of reality on a higher level and allows the individual and society to make better decisions. So as individuals for ourselves, it's important to transcend, to be established in the self, but as groups also, it is important to create the effect so we can find truly the solutions to the problems we face. And solutions will come when the light comes. Sometimes the solutions are sitting there on the table, but if it is dark, you don't see them. And all you need is the light. You bring the light and they are there. So there will be practical, simple solutions, but bringing the light so the solutions are found is very important also. How does that differ, this group consciousness, this shared meditation? How does that differ from the individual transcendental meditation with an individual? Is that an intention that the group chooses to hold and agrees to hold? Or how do they incorporate that into their meditation? In fact, it is very innocent. So we don't try to change things from a specific uh, angle or perspective. It's enough to go back to the self, awaken the inner self, and that awakens the, uh, the light, if you like, in, in the group. So there is no sense necessarily of planning something on the thought level, because targeted thought is helpful, can be helpful, but if it is on the surface level, which means you remember the ocean, if you put your thought on the surface level of the waves, then its effect is very, very uh, limited. If you project the thought from the bottom of the ocean, then it's very powerful and its outreach is, is very, very strong. You know, there was this um, movie, The Secret, 
uh, and they talk about thought and the importance of thought and that how they achieve the thought. But one thing they missed is from what level the thought is being projected. Mm, if the level, if the thought is projected on the surface level, yeah. its impact is very limited. So one can say, oh, let me put my thought, let me concentrate on this, etc. That's fine. Maybe it will help. It could help. I don't deny that. But if you can transcend and act from the unified field, then you have a very powerful thought. Mm -hmm. you know, it's similar to the fact that as you go deeper in nature, the energy is bigger. You know, it's, it's an analogy, so we don't take it like this. But if you use the atomic energy, it's much more powerful than the gross energy on the surface uh, because it's more penetrating and it, it uses very deep levels of nature. Um, if you awaken the inner unified field, then your action is reaching even beyond time and space. And that's how the effect is not local anymore. The effect is more generalized because you are having what we call a field effect rather than a localized effect. On the surface, it's localized effect. On the depth, it's field effect. It's more penetrating and more beyond the limitations of space and time. As head of the International Transcendental Meditation Organizations in over 100 countries, Dr. Nader, what does your job entail? What is your work day like? And how do you, how do you occupy that career as head of International Transcendental Meditation? What does that look like? It's wonderful because uh... It's a bunch of good friends <laughs> who are all uh, on the same path and uh, having their own life also uh, at the same time devoted to uh, spreading and making this knowledge available. So we are structured in an organized way so that we have uh, responsible people for countries and within countries, responsible people for states and cities. And we have centers. And the system is really almost runs automatically. So it's uh, needed that we meet from time to time to review policies and changing conditions, how to expand the knowledge, how to make it available. Uh, and so my, my job is really as a witness also, I take a step back in order to be able to see the whole. I cannot be micromanaging because it gets me into the small things. So the micromanagement <clears throat> happens on different layers, different levels. And if there are some things that happen, they are taken care of by those who are administering their area. And if there is something on a global level, uh, we discuss it together. And I'm here to create balance, make sure that the opinions are, uh, you know, fulfilling the goal and that everybody's happy. And uh, so it's a lot of uh, discussion and thinking and planning together in a friendly, uh, enjoyable way. I also spend a lot of time on knowledge. And so that's how I got to write the book and give a paradigm of consciousness. Uh, and also now the pleasure to be with you, for example, mm -hmm. is part of my, my joy. and. Um, part of my duty in a sense. Well, you teach, you speak, you write, you're an author, you travel, you've got this amazing career. And I know that you've also interviewed other people in a master series. And so outside of the Maharishi, who's the most fascinating person, Dr. Nader, that you have met or connected with recently? Um. <laughs> Uh, there are all wonderful people, uh, you know, uh, they don't have to be um, to be people who are well known internationally or anything, just sometimes uh, simple people that inspire you uh, for from their simplicity, their uh, goodness, their candid, simple reality of life. And there are many like this, you know, it's... Um, 
I've, I've made this uh, interview with David Lynch, uh, who is also uh, somebody, you know, one can admire for his creativity, his intelligence, and his true desire to make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And so there are also, you know, the people you meet every day, and sometimes some people, they strike you in their happiness and their joy and in their desire to do, uh, to make a difference. Has there been a story or a situation, a person who really inspired you because they were one way when they started, and then upon engaging in transcendental meditation, they underwent this incredible or remarkable change? And if so, what was that? Um, yeah, lots of, again, lots of people who have, who have done it. It's, I was mostly like self-referral in the sense of what it did to me, uh, you know, and, um, the experience of others that have, of course, inspired me, uh, all those who have, um, discussed it, uh, you know, um, there was a discussion between Ray Dalio and Martin Scorsese where they both say how uh, it brought the creativity in them and made them make the right decisions. And in this, Scorsese says he, he felt that um, if he has like a character, he doesn't know how to put it together. Uh, when he transcends, he comes out and he has all of this absolutely there and sees it because he is, you know, diving deep and finding the resource and the creativity that is within him, but was somehow shadowed or something, and then creates, uh, makes him create things. And like that, there are amazing people who did wonderful things, uh, who come out and are, you know, uh, talking about it to the public and encouraging them. Uh, so there are many examples of great celebrities and, and uh, leaders in the world who, who understand that and, and uh, talk about it and are inspiring. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Nader, this is Dare to Dream. And my question <laughs> to you is, what do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams, goals, or visions? A world in peace and happiness. Uh, a world where everybody has their place. Um, I've uh, launched a, a kind of a motto now for the activities, and that is make life work for everyone. And that will be the dream where people understand the value of consciousness. They dive within themselves. They discover the beauty that is within them and don't uh, see themselves from a small perspective, but from the true perspective of them being totally wholeness free and able to share and grow and uh, express their creativity. So a world where life works for everyone is my dream. And folks who are listening or watching, and thinking, I would like to have this experience. I'd like to incorporate this in my life. Where can they go to find a class about transcendental meditation? We have a simple site where they can put their location where they are and then ask for a teacher. It's very simple. It's called TM for Transcendental Meditation. So tm.org. And if they like to visit my site, you mentioned, uh, mentioned it, but it's drtonynader.com. So D-R-T-O-N-Y-N-A-D-E-R.com. So, uh, Dr. Tony Nader. Ah, and you said .com, not org? Uh, I think we have both. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay, great. So put the doctor before Tony, N-A-D-E-R.org or com. Beautiful. And tm.org is also uh, one of our great places. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for everything you shared. Thank you for your book too, by the way, and for the exploration you went on your book as an author and as a scientist and a Vedic uh, expert. 
Is there anything here you'd like to say to the listeners and the folks who are watching here at the end? I enjoy your talk very much and uh, I'd like them to listen to you more. <laughs> and of course, try transcendental meditation. It's really simple, it's easy. Uh, children can practice it from even the age of five. It doesn't require a change in your lifestyle or behavior or anything. You just sit comfortably in a chair, close the eyes, and it's a moment of joy that you encounter by going back to yourself and settling down and have all the benefits from it. So it's not a, a job to do or something that people say, gosh, I have to do one thing more. It's something people run to do because it's a pleasant moment and uh, has great benefits. I end today's show with this quote from Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and it is this. By enlivening this most basic level of life, transcendental meditation is that one simple procedure which can raise the life of every individual and every society to its full dignity in which problems are absent and perfect health, happiness, and a rapid pace of progress are the natural features of life. If you are enjoying this podcast and are listening to us and you like to see us, do so and subscribe at youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. I do read all your comments and I get back to you. Thank you for following us and subscribe to the Dare to Dream podcast so you can hear and watch this number one weekly transformation conversation. My guest next week, funny enough, we mentioned the secret. My guest next week is Bob Doyle known him for years, and he's best known for being in The Secret. And he's here, of course, he's progressed as well. He's going to be talking about a new grounded and biological look at what actually controls our experiences. Thank you for tuning in. And remember, don't just dare to dream, dare to turn all your dreams into your reality and be sure to meditate so you can change your life, society's life, and humanity's life.